Thank you for visiting Pastor Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWire.com. webinar seminar whatever 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 you want to call it we're gonna we're gonna do something a little different this time we're gonna use the preakness card as an example and we're definitely going to take some you know q a um from everybody out there but really this is this this is a webinar a seminar whatever you want to call it to really help people improve um their their, their betting in their game and th there are certain techniques and, and certain ways of doing that. And, you, you know, some of this may sound a little elementary and, and, and uh, you know, maybe not advanced, but some of it, may, and some of it may sound the opposite, may sound ad advanced, but fundamentals are very important. And I'll give you two examples with two, two different sports. Uh, Floyd, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather was a great fighter, okay? He was a, a, a fantastic boxer. He wasn't really a knockout puncher. Uh, he won most of his fights with his finesse and skill. Sure, can a puncher take him out with a lucky shot? Absolutely. But most of the time, as his record shows, a, 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 a master of their art will beat someone who is not a master of their art with fundamentals. And I'll give you another example. Um, if anyone's ever driven a competitive type of race car, or even a very fast car, like a, a Ferrari, a Porsche, a Maserati, uh, any, any car like that on a, on a track or just faster than they should have on, on, on the streets, which sometimes we have a tendency to do. When you learn to drive a car, there are certain fundamentals and certain things that you do. And if you put two drivers, one who has those fundamentals, okay, and one who has been taught how to hold the wheel, how to sit, how to position themselves, when to begin their turn, when to ease off the gas, when to get on the gas, when to hit the brake, when not to, and you put them in, 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 a, in a similar car to someone who just drives any way they want or just doesn't have those basic fundamentals, the guy with the good fundamentals is going to beat the other guy nine out of 10 times. Okay. We play a game that's a marathon. All right. It's not all about Saturday's races. It's not all about one race. It's about beating the game over time. And that's a very difficult thing to do because we play a game where we're all, all of us, no matter how good you are, you are going to be wrong a lot more than you're going to be right. OK, if you're right, 20, 25 percent, 30 percent of the time, you're doing phenomenally. OK, um, if you're right half the time, you're unbelievable. But even if you are that good handicapping and you don't know how to structure tickets and you don't know how to manage your money and you don't have the discipline it takes to beat this game, no matter how good you are, you're not going to win over time because the game will swallow you up. Uh, I was very successful at it for a long time. There's an abundance of information out there. One of the reasons I decided to do this and, and Michael and I decided to do this is we hear so many people talking on social media about structuring tickets and helping people and churn and this, and there's some really good information out there. Um, Mark DiLorenzo is an example. He, I, I believe is here. Um, if not, he may be joining us later. He gives out a lot of great information, okay? Ticket structure, um, well thought out wages and, and things. But there are people out there that give out a lot of garbage. And I could see just looking at it that over time, they can't win. And when I talk about win, all right, I don't mean a guy who churns 50 or 100,000 a year or 200,000 a year or a million a year. Uh, let's just take the $100,000 number and yeah, they churned 100,000 and they won 102,000. So they made 2,000. Not impressed. Good luck to you. You, know I mean? um, you might have had I mean, a good I mean, It's not too bad. You know, it, 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 okay, that's great. But if you're playing for that reason, 
then you're not playing for the reason that I play. If I if I bet a hundred thousand over the course of the year, I want to win a hundred thousand. I want to win two hundred thousand, or I don't feel like I had a, a good year. All right. I want to beat the game and make my scores. And and everything that I'm going to talk about tonight is going to be geared towards that mindset. Okay. So. It may not be for everybody. You know, some people play for fun. Some people play for whatever the reason may be. I play to take down scores and beat the game. And that's what my play over the years, and I've been doing this close to 50 years, that's what I've evolved to. And that's what this is going to help some people understand how you can do that. And the first thing that you've got to realize is fundamentals. And one of the things that 90% of handicappers do wrong and they do it wrong in the past performances and they do it wrong when they read sheets, be it thoroughgraph, like I use, ragazins, whatever the case may be, all right? And this gets back to learning how to drive that race car. Learn how to drive the race car. Hands are at two o'clock, okay? They're not at two o'clock, they're wrong, okay? Basic fundamentals. When you read the form, human nature tells you or or pulls you to read from the most recent race down. You go down, okay? And that's almost how the form is designed. And that's how the sheets and the thoroughbreds are designed. So you're looking at the last race and then you work your way down. Wrong way to read it. It's the wrong way to read. What you want to do is go, when I I print my formula to pass performances, and I'm a little excessive, I understand that. I print all the races and I start from the bottom up. Okay, I read the oldest race before I read the most recent race. Now, people might say, well, the most recent race is the one that matters. Some some people only want to see the last two or three races. Okay, they may beat me today. In the long run, they're not going to beat me. And I'll tell you why. When you read from the bottom up, okay, and you absorb the, the, the historical patterns of the racehorse, okay, you pick up patterns and idiosyncrasies that get washed away when you read from the bottom that from the top down okay patterns and things that you as a handicapper because nobody's opinion is better than yours okay you want to bet and bank on your opinion not anybody else's okay you want to take advice you want to consider the opinion of good people but once you digest their opinion, you apply it to your opinion and you make your way during decisions. And when you do that, you go from the bottom up, you see patterns and things that stick out to you, to your way of analyzing a race, to your way of looking at the pace, to your way of projecting how the race is going to run and who's going to be at the wire first. If you do it from the top down, you lose that. Okay, it's much harder to see. And the same thing with the sheets, thoroughgraph, okay, or ragazins, whichever one you may be using. When you want to, sheets, it's not all about the number, it's all about the pattern, okay? People think, oh, this guy's got the fastest number, he's the fastest horse in the race. Not necessarily, it's the pattern, okay? You have to learn to look at patterns. History repeats patterns repeat and they have tells so when you go from the bottom up you see the historical progression and patterns of the horse now of course you apply that to all the other things you're looking for layoffs this that frequency of starts whatever your handicapping bag of tools shows you but you're looking at the patterns that's that's what you want to focus on okay um, so th- 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 those are the basics of, of, of how you read past performances and, and sheets that a lot of people just get wrong. 90% of handicappers, whether they want to tell you the truth and admit it, they'll tell you, yeah, no, I look at the last race first. My opinion, they're all, they're all reading the book wrong. Okay. No, and going, and going back to your point, John, and like using your opinion, like your own opinion, not necessarily everyone else's, but uh, a good example was Derby week, uh, uh, you really liked Dunbar Road in that race that uh, uh, She Dares the Devil ended up winning, right? Yes, I did. Right. So I didn't. I loved She Dares the Devil, and I was actually really against Dunbar Road. But I used I used your super effective strategy that you taught me, right? You have a strong – I keyed two long shots in second, and I threw out Dunbar Road, and I did all out for – and it paid – you know, I picked, it was a $20 ticket that paid 450 
and it was against your opinion, right? But it's it was still using those I fundamental an example where I was dead wrong in the race. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sorry, not trying to call you help, but but I'm but I'm getting your point. I'm using your your fundamental strategy of how to do a super hundred percent. And we'll talk about ticket structure because that's so crucial. Okay. Um, ticket structure is, is crucial and money management is crucial. Okay. They are, they are the elements to success along with your handicapping. You know, if you take two people that pick the same amount of winners and one knows how to bet and one doesn't know how to bet, then your guy who knows how to bet or girl who knows how to bet is going to win a lot more than the other guy. How can you play that with firsts and majors? We'll get to all those questions. So I just hang hang on to your questions and, and we'll, we'll get to them all, okay? Um, I won't leave anybody hanging with any questions. So if you have a question though, just hang on to them. Um, now, we know we're gonna be wrong more than we're, 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 we're right, okay? We know that there's takeout, we know that there's sharks in the water. Um, and we know that everybody's looking for an edge. So one of the most important things is to look for the edge that other people don't look for. And the best way in today's game to find that is through replay work. And replays and watching replays, that's an art in and of itself as, as well. And it's something that a lot of people have a tendency to do wrong, okay? And it all, all of this is because what I'm telling you goes against human nature. The human nature, the inclination that is, is just in us is if you're watching a race, who are you watching? You're watching who you bet, you're watching who's in front, or you're watching who the announcer is calling. 90% of the people do that 90% of the time. That's what we just normally have a tendency to do. And that's fine. But if you want to get tells out of a race and trips out of a race that can lead you to bet on a horse that somebody else might not be betting on, okay? And you're making notes on track biases and trips and things of that nature, okay? You wanna watch a race a couple of times because you don't wanna only watch it and watch those three horses that I mentioned, who's on the lead, who's making a move that the announcer's calling or who you bet on. Cause you're gonna miss that horse who's trapped on the inside and never got out. You're gonna miss that horse that was between horses and uncomfortable the whole trip and never got a chance to show what he can do. You're gonna miss that horse that the jockey was just sitting on, never asked to run because he just was giving him a race or he wasn't in shape or today wasn't the day. You're gonna miss so many different things that you need to see to get that edge that is not in the past performances or in the notes, okay? Because what's in the past performances and then in the notes, everybody sees, okay? When we talk about that horse that's got the fastest number, okay, nine out of 10 times, the horse that's got the fastest number is a short price because so many people read the sheets nowadays that they're all over these, you know, these horses. So, how do you do that? You watch replays and you watch in a way that leads you to something that somebody else might not see. And that's by not focusing on who's in front, who the announcer is calling or who you bet on. Okay, yeah, you're gonna watch those and make your notes on those as well. It's a very good idea. Formulator allows you to do it within the system, but if you don't use Formulator, it's a just fantastic idea to keep notes on horses and make your own trip notes. There's services out there that do it. I have tracking trips where I do it on certain horses. I'm not here to sell that to anybody right now. Um, there's, I, I think something called trip note pros, which I'm not familiar with that does the same thing. Um, but there's no better set of eyes than yourself. What I say about tracking trips is I'm your second set of trained eyes. Why am I the second set? Because the first set is yours. What's important to you. The most important opinion is yours. You can take opinions from myself, from guys like Mark DiLorenzo and apply it and take it as a valued opinion. But at the end of the day, it's your money and your opinion and your decision on what you want to bet. And you've got to weed out the garbage information's out there. And, 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 and a lot of us who are at different levels of the game tend to rely a little bit more on other people's opinions and other people's information. 
And all I'll say to that is it's okay, but just be careful of who you're listening to because there's a lot of people out there that sound like they know what they're doing and they don't have a clue. Okay. And you just get in that long list of people that lose money and, 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 and donate to the sharks in the water. And that's not where you want to be if you want to survive in this game long term. So with all of that, okay, we're up against takeout. We're up against uh, cannibalized pools. We're up against uh, value loss because of you know, a lot of sharp money out there and a lot of uh, an, an abundance of information with, the, you know, formulated sheets, this, that. So how do we beat that? We beat that by betting smart and managing our money correctly. And most important thing is when you're right, knowing how to make it count. Okay. And I do some things and don't do some things that a lot of betters will tell you, John's nuts. Okay. You can't do that. All right. And I say, no, they're wrong. You can do that and be successful. And I have, I've, 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 I don't have to prove it to anybody else. I've proven it to myself and lived off it. So I don't have to, I don't worry about what anybody else thinks. I know from where I come. So with that said, another thing in human nature is our, our inclination, our desire is to cash as many tickets as possible which means we have to use as many horses as possible because we want to cash as many tickets as possible. You get swallowed up that way over time, all right? You don't, your, your black column winds up much lower than the red column over time when you do that, okay? What you have to grasp, most important thing that I would say you take away from this seminar is this, cash less tickets, but win more money. Okay, because that at the end of the day, that's what matters, winning more money. You want to win more money. And that might mean you're going to cash less tickets because you're not going to use every horse. You're going to use a couple of horses and you're going to get more on them. So yeah, you're going to lose more. But when you win, you're going to win more. And that's what's going to make the black column bigger than the red column at the end of the day. And that's a tough concept to grasp. A lot of people never grasp it. OK, um, and I'll use an example that I used when I think we did our, our, our derby webinar. You know, I had a friend who said, love the horse in, 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 in a pick five sequence. OK, love this horse. Was talking, I'm going to bet this horse. I love this horse. Love this horse. Wound up betting the pick five. Paid like six thousand in change. Shows me, look, the way I bet you're wrong. I bet I hit the pick five. I won six thousand dollars on a on a five hundred dollar bet. OK. I'm like, no, you didn't, all right? You loved this horse. You used this horse that you loved, but you used two others. So you didn't win 6,000. You lost 12,000, okay? You think you won six. You lost 12 because you should have used only the horse you loved and risked tearing up the ticket. And if you were right, winning 18,000 instead of 6,000 because three times six is 18. So he didn't win 6,000. He lost 12,000. Over the course of a year, that kills you. It kills you. It, it, it almost makes it mathematically impossible for you to be a winner at this game. And if that's the case, if you believe that the game is not a skill game, okay, which I believe that it is, if you believe it's not, play slots, play the lotto, or you know, don't even bother reading the form. Just, just play numbers. What's, what's the difference? If it's a skill game, get good at it. Okay, get good information from people who know and people who bet. The silliest people in the world, in my opinion, are the ones that go on and watch shows like, and no disparity on any, any network or their coverage or anything like that. I'm not here to do that. But there are people that are on, you, 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 you know, are front people for racing that are there to attract people to race and say, oh, here's my pick four play. Here's my pick five play. Here's this. They're probably not betting those tickets and if they do half of those tickets can't win before the horses get to the starting gate okay so to me if you're listening to that and going as, a, as a, on with those people as a guide 
pick numbers. Don't waste your time. You know what I mean? Have some fun while they're talking and just pick numbers because you got the same shot at the end of the day anyway. Um, that's entertainment. That's there to just kind of, you know, put on the, on the show. If you want to win and you want to learn, you got to listen to people who know what they're talking about and actually bet their money. I lived for years. I was a professional player. I survived by betting on the horses. If I didn't win, I had no money to do what life demands you have money to do. So you have to, you, 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 you know, live that to understand it. And someone who doesn't bet, someone who's never bet case money, okay? And by I say case money, money that was important to them, okay? Not just recreational money. When I was playing professionally, I didn't have what you would call, quote, recreational money. All right, that was my living, okay? That was my, my bank vault was my living. So unless you're really dealing with somebody that knows that feeling, that knows how, hey, this bet is important. So I'm gonna make it count and I'm gonna try and find the right edge and the right race to bet, then you're listening to, the, you know, my opinion, gibberish. Um, so it's important to find and seek that right kind of information. And it, and it, and it is out there. Now, Vital, vital is, is how you manage your money, okay? Money management is, is, is so, so important. It's as important as handicapping, and it's as important as structuring your tickets, and it's not the same thing, okay? You could know how to structure tickets and know how to handicap, but if you don't know how to manage your money, you're also going to get swallowed. And by managing your money, I say this, okay, let's say you go to the track, and I want to use numbers that everybody can can relate to. Okay, so I'm going to use smaller numbers because there's there's smaller players out there, and you know there's bigger players. Sometimes you people some people go to the track with ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to gamble. Um, I used to go to Gulfstream and, and bet pretty heavily. Okay, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand a day years ago, and I used to sit in this little enclave at the old restaurant at Gulfstream and Pete Rose used to be there all the time and sit and he used to keep stacks of hundreds right on the table up there open up there 200 250,000 okay and nine and no no disparagement to Pete okay I'm sure he had his good days but 90% of the time by the end of the day that stack was gone and <laughs> his girlfriend to go cash a check or whatever else he had, had to do um so you know, there's all different levels of, of play. So you can be playing with uh, 10,000, 100,000 or a hundred dollars. Okay. So I'm going to use low numbers so people can relate. And, you know, a hundred dollars is not that it's a low number, but it's low enough that people are going to be able to relate. So let's say Saturday's Preakness day, you go to the racetrack with a hundred dollars. That's your betting money for the day. Okay. Now there's a dozen races. How do you spend your hundred dollars? Okay, that's very important. You're a good handicapper. You know how to pick winners. You know how to structure a ticket within your budget and structure your ticket, but you don't know how to manage your money. So now, how do you play that hundred dollars? Okay, that's as important as anything else we're going to talk about. What I do, okay, and 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 how I attack it is I say, okay, all right what is the sequence or what is the bet and it doesn't have to be a pick four five six or three everybody wants to gravitate to those bets because of the rolling action okay it can be one of those bets and they're great bets and i love them myself but i didn't marry them and neither did you okay so your best shot okay where you think you have your best shot could be a win bet, could be an exact, could be a triple, could be a, a multi-race wager, whatever it is. But you decide based on your handicapping where you think the right price at the best, the best price with the best shot for you to hit is on that card. And if your bankroll is a hundred dollars, okay, I say you at least save 50% of your bankroll for that wager. Okay, you bet the most. If you spread your bankroll out that hundred dollars over all the different wages, okay, and the main one's right and all the others are wrong, guess what? Your 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 best opinion got you even for the day. 
or maybe won you a couple of dollars, or maybe even you lost, depending on the price. You never put yourself in a position for that to happen. Okay, that's just bad, bad money management. Okay, if your best shot wins, you are supposed to have a good day. All right, whatever that good day is, depending on what your bankroll is, what your you know your your your, your financial level of playing is, when you hit your major wager, your best bet on the card. You're supposed to have a, have, a, have a good day. And we all make these mistakes from time to time. I even still, I've been doing this my, my since I was a little kid, practically a toddler. I still make the mistakes sometimes, but very rarely. And, you know, I try and eliminate it altogether. And, and you should as well. So at least half your bankroll. There are some days, okay? And I kid you not, where I've gone to the track with $10,000 in my pocket to bet for the day, okay? And I'll bet nine of that 10,000 in that one race or that one sequence. And the other thousand, I'll spread out amongst my other opinions or whatever else I want to do on, on the day. And I would do the same thing if it was a hundred dollar bankroll. So, so in those situations, John, is that typically a vertical wager or are you trying to do like small horizontals well, to that? No, it's not a typical. Or a straight, straight windfall. I said, it's whatever, whatever I think is my best bet of that day, be it, it uh, 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 a vertical wager, a horizontal wager, but whatever. It doesn't matter if it's a pick four. doesn't matter if it's a superfecta. Whatever I think is the best bet for my opinion, value-wise, and where I feel like I have the best shot to collect and be right at a good price, that's where the bulk of my money is going that day. Because if I'm right where I think I'm going to be right, I want to make it count, okay? The other ones, if I'm right or wrong, are just a little gravy or I can absorb the loss. And if I'm wrong in that major wager, then okay, it wasn't my day. We lived to fight another day. But when I'm right, okay, and I've been doing this long enough to know I'm going to be right enough times that at the end of the year, if I keep doing it this way, I'm going to come out ahead. I'm going to beat them. But it takes such discipline to do and this is the kind of discipline that it takes. And I will, I, I, I will tell you, this is something else that most players don't have the discipline to do. And if I didn't have that discipline, I don't think I ever would have beat this game for as long as I did. But when I got away from playing pick six is when they introduced the pick five and the pick four and the pick six pools got diluted because I was a big pick six player for a long time. That, that was my bread and butter, okay? And I'm getting back to that now because Naira brought back the $1 pick six and I'm yeah. really liking it. But I wish it was $2, but that's a, a story for another day that we can talk about. But when I switched to the pick fours, at that time, Naira had a $2 minimum on the pick four, okay? And I'm all for a $2 minimum. I don't like the 50 cent minimum. And what I started doing at that time was... I love the pick four and they used to pay so much more than the parlays when they were $2. Okay. And what I used to do is I went for maybe a couple of years. Okay. And I had an unbelievable run where I was winning. Um, and I've, I've got the tax returns. I told this once to Michael on another show. I got a, in my garage, I got a box of tax returns. I could, I could show you if I had to, but I was winning. It was hard. next to your brick. Right. Exactly. 200, 400, 360, 420,000 a year winning, gambling winnings, okay? Years in a row, years running, all the tax returns I got them because I filed that way. I've been through gambling audits. Um, but here's what I did for a long time and the discipline was incredible, okay? I would go and I would bet $1,500 a day only in the late pick four at Naira, whether they were at Belmont or Saratoga. I don't think I really did it at Aqueduct, but I might have, I, I just don't remember. I never, I know I was probably betting Gulfstream during Aqueduct back then. But what I would do is I would handicap the late pick four and I would play my ticket 
in whatever amount I could based on who I wanted to use. So some days I would have a, a $5 pick four and it would cost me 1500. Some days, a lot of days I'd have a 20 or a $40 pick four or a 50 or a $60 pick four. I remember one of the biggest scores I made, uh, I talked about when I was on Jason Dean's podcast. I don't even remember how many times I had to pick four, but a horse named Light Dancer won. Valpony won the last race at Saratoga. Um, needed a bag to take out uh, the, the money out of the track, li 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 literally. The best thing a mutual clerk has ever said to me at the racetrack after they ran my ticket, looked up at me and said, you want me to see if I can get a bag? Those are the words you kind of hear, want to hear. We don't hear that anymore because now we're betting on the phone. I can't even remember the last time I went and bet at, at the window. So, what I would do is I would bet that 1500 and let's say I would bet a $20 pick four or a $100 pick four, which I did many times, a $200 pick four, which I did many times. I think I even got tickets in this thing I could show you here that are structured that way. I found some old Hollywood Park tickets that I used to bet structured that way that are in this case. But let's say I had a single, okay? And I had a $200 pick four. And let's say the single was in the first leg or the third leg. Better yet, better example, the third leg. And bang, I got knocked out in the first leg and my 1500 was gone, okay? Most people would chase that money and most people would say, hey, you're single, you didn't get there, you, know, you, know, you gotta bet the single. No, I didn't. I waited till the next day and I went back to the track with 1500 and did it all over again because I knew I had learned from years before of, of, of just trial and error, error and living that I may pass up a win bet on my single, but I have a system and a technique and a discipline that's working for me. At the end of the year, I'm winning a considerable amount of money. If it's not broke, I'm not gonna fix it, it's working. Um, and when I ultimately stopped doing that was when they lowered it to the 50 cents and, 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 and it just ch changed everything. Um, but, but most players that you will speak to, you will find very few players that have that kind of discipline that can bet $1,500, okay? And I'm talking years ago. So $1,500 then was probably like 5,000 today. I don't know how to do that kind of math inflation or, you, you know, that's not, not my thing. If there's any teachers or mathematicians out there, you tell me what 1,500. Like two cans of gas on the East Coast right now. Uh, you, know, you tell me what 1,500, you know, in the 90s was today, you know what I mean? I'm, you know, because that's probably when this was. So most players, will chase that money. They'll get knocked out and they'll chase that money. All right. I say you can't do it. If you go to the track with that hundred dollar bankroll that we discussed earlier and you lose that big bet and you decided, you know what, John's right. I'm going to try his system on Saturday. I'm going to the pre kids with a hundred dollars. Bang. The race I love, I bet $75. I lost. John's an idiot. I don't know why I <laughs> About that now I got $25 and I never going to win my 75 back which you shouldn't even be thinking about winning your 75 back you should be thinking of your $25 making you a winner far and above that okay you don't chase money you lost that's gone you lost it already so every bet should be a new chapter but most people say, oh, you know what? Now I got to go back. I got I to gotta chase that money. I may even have to go to the ATM and take out another $75 to make up for the $75 that John made me lose. Okay. And that'll happen to somebody that's probably watching this, this webinar. But it doesn't matter. It's the long run that counts. So what you really want to do is take your money, take the bulk of your bankroll and put it towards where you think you have your best shot. So if your best shot is right, you made it count, all right? Now, the next thing I'm gonna to touch on is ticket structure. And again, we're gonna to get to get to you know, Q and A and we'll use the practice card as examples with opinions and, and, and everything, but we're not quite there yet. Ticket structure. We'll start with Superfectors because Mike, Mike, Michael mentioned that he won a Superfector using my, my strategy. For sure. Or my technique of how I like to bet Superfectors. I like to turn Superfectors and even triples 
when I can into exactness. Okay. So let's say to keep things simple, I like number one. I think number one is going to win. Now, one of the things and two of the things that I never do that people are going to tell you they should do and I'm crazy is I don't hedge. So that means I don't bet against my opinion to cover myself. Okay. I believe that's long-term disaster. I don't use horses defensively. In other words, uh, I don't like the favorite. So I'm going to throw him on my pick four or pick five anyway, because, you know, he's the favorite and I got to use him just in case he wins. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in hedging. And this is something that I've argued with a lot of people about. And again, it comes down to that discipline and that long-term philosophy is I don't reverse exactors and I don't box. A box is automatically five losing bets or whatever the case is with the takeout, the shots and everything else. To me, that's, that, that's bad. So if I bet an exact, if I like the one and I think, and we're just keeping it simple, the two or the three are the most likely horses to run second if the one wins. I'll bet one, two, one, three. I won't box them and I won't reverse them. If it comes to one, I lose. But if it comes one, two, I got it twice as many times because I didn't make an automatic losing bet because one of those, one of those bets has to lose. So I like to do it where I have as few losing bets as possible. So I'll take one, two, one, three. That's it. If the one wins, I hopefully hit the exact. If the one's a big enough price, I'll bet the one to win. And I'll bet the one, two and the one, three exactness. So if the one wins, I win anyway. And if the two or three run second, we add some gravy. Now, if it's a super effective race, okay, I'll take it the same way. One with the two, three with, if I can afford it, depending on my bankroll and depending on, you, you know, how much I want to invest, and how many horses there are in the race, I really like to go all all in the third and fourth slots, but that gets expensive and it's not, it's not for everybody. So ideally what I like to do if I'm making a big investment and I'm putting the bulk of my bankroll into a super effector, which I will do on certain days and in certain races, I would go one with two, three, with all, with all. And, and I think we talked about this on that Superfecta podcast, John. There, there, there are certain days that are really good for Superfectas, and I, I triple crowns are definitely some of those days. Absolutely, those, those the, 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 the Derby days is, is the best. It's just now they become expensive because they don't let you do it for ten cents anymore. But I'm for that. I'd rather invest the money and hit that two hundred two hundred thousand dollar Superfecta a couple of times than ten cents. It's just. just you know, again, it's long-term thinking, but not everybody has the money to go all, all. So how I would bet it on a short bankroll, okay, a short bankroll, I would take the super effective one with two, three, with two, three, four, five, with all. Okay, so this way, if I hit the exacta, I got four horses that give me a shot to hit the triple. And if I hit the triple, I automatically hit the super because in the last leg of the super, I always talk about not using the all button and I don't use the all button in pick fours, fives and sixes. Very, very rarely, very, very rarely. But in a super factor in the fourth slot, to me, that's a different animal. I'm, I always want all in the fourth slot because there's too many intangibles who stopped riding, who gave up, who saw they weren't going to win and mailed it in. Uh, nobody, I don't care how good at this game you are, nobody can handicap fourth place. And this game has a lot of idiosyncrasies. And one of them is, and you all know this, because it's happened to everyone listening to this show. And we, we've only got a couple of people on, but if we had 10,000 people on, I'd say the same thing. We've all been beat by the one horse we left out. It happened to me the other day. I said, I don't use all. This week, last weekend at Santa Anita, I punched a pick four or five. I forget which one it was. Pretty good. And in one race, there were seven horses and I used six of them. And that, that, that girl jockey won the race with the one horse that I thought couldn't possibly win. It was the seven horse. Um, the was it Jessica Pfeiffer? Huh? Jessica Pfeiffer? No, the other one. Ellingwood. Ellingswood. Oh, yeah. Is it a girl? I don't know if it's not. I apologize. I no disrespect. I just am not familiar with who the rider, but it was that Ellingswood or Ellingswood rider, um, whoever it is. 
One horse I left out, of course, coming down the stretch, the horse was up there, drop back, is re-rallying on the outside. And I'm like, of course, I don't use all. I'm getting knocked out of this for sure. Um, and I love the single who wound up winning easy. Um, I think it was the horse on Berto where Spoli rode in the last race. He went by like, by literally by eight lengths going, going, going away. Like he was five or six to one in the morning line, went off three to one. And I missed everything because hard, hard, the Nobly Don Calabrese head that I have refuses to go all. And it just, it just happens. So, but I don't do it because in the long run, I know I'll hit enough for them. And if I can eliminate horses, that enables me to increase the amount that I wager. But in a super factor, different story. I don't believe anybody can handicap the fourth slot of a race. And if you try and get cute and say, well, you know what? This horse is so bad, he can't even run fourth. That's the one that'll snake you and jump up and run forth at 80 to one. And you wind up tearing up your ticket because you tried to get cute. So I'm against the all button, except in the last leg of the super. So my supers are structured depending on the bankroll and depending on the day. Like I said, one with two or three second with as many as I can afford to use in the third slot, always the same always the two that are in the second slot or in the third slot, obviously. That's just common sense. If I think they can run second, obviously I think they can run third. And in the last leg, I use all. Now, another thing that I will do, I said that I don't reverse and I don't reverse exactness, but we're talking about superfectors and superfectors are a different animal. And there's so many times, like Michael said, on certain days, they're overlooked, okay? And they're tremendous value in them. So what I will do is if I'm dealing with price horses, like using the same example, let's say the one is a 10 to one shot, okay? Or a 15 to one shot, because that doesn't scare me. When I like a horse that's a big price, I have a tendency to bet more because I want to make it count when I'm right. So I could be right on a 10 or 20 to one shot the same way I could be right on a, on, on a, on a two to one shot or an eight to five shot, you know? So I'll take... My super, I'll go one with two, three, with four horses with all. But now I'm dealing with a big price, so I want to make my score. So if I'm putting the bulk of my bankroll into that super, I've got some room. So then I'll take one with the horses I used in the third slot with two, three, with all. Then I'll take one with all with the horses in the third slot and again with two, three. So I'll break it up. So if the one wins and the two or the three run anywhere, second, third or fourth, and my other, you know, my, my third slot horses run anywhere in there, I got the all in each, you know, in each slot. Okay, now that's a big investment. But if you're betting big money for those that are betting a little bit more or on a day when you like a long shot at a track where they have the 10 cent denomination, it's still a worthwhile bet because you can hit a yeah. big, big number. If you're key in a horse, that's a price. I, I think the other big advantage too is once you get into the super effective bets, there's way less of the computer, like the computers are way less efficient, the more complicated the bet. They're very efficient in the doubles and the exactos, but, and, and John, you could speak to this obviously better than I can, but the, the more complicated the bet, the more advantage the, the, the handicapper has versus the computer. Point taken. And, and then and the other thing is the less information available and the more intangibles, the, 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 the more an advantage that the, exactly. handicapper, the handicapper has. Um, memory is such a key when it comes to that. If there are things in your memory that you know that are not jump out statistics, that gives you an advantage. Your computer doesn't have that kind of memory. Okay, the computer didn't see a race you saw two years ago. A computer didn't know that, uh, you know, Bill Mott likes to give this particular Barnes horses a race before he pops with them. You, you know, those kind of things give you an edge over the computer players too, but that's a, a, a whole, it's a whole other show. So super effectors and triples, okay? Triples is a lot, is another bet that people don't go after nearly enough in my opinion, and you can play them the same way. One with, two, three, with all. One with all, with two, three. If the one wins and the two or three run second or third, you're hitting the triple. And if your one is a 
10 to one shot or a 20 to one shot or an eight to one shot. Okay. And the two, three decent prices or whatever they are, you got that all in the two slots. Okay. Argument's sake, one wins a 10 to one in your all slot. You catch a 20, 30 to one shot. And then the two, three is one of them's five to one. Bang. You hit a couple of thousand dollar triple, you know, maybe a $10,000 triple. I mean, you give yourself, you put yourself in a position to do that. And so many times we're led to and drawn to and steered to the pick three or the pick four or the pick five, which are great bets. I'm not knocking them, but, but again, we didn't marry them. Okay. And you will never see anybody on any analyst or you know, anybody on TV tell you, you know, you'll hear them say, Oh, we're starting another pick four or there's another pick three starting now, or there's a, you know, the late double. You'll never say, Hey, here's another great shot to hit the super factor or another great shot to hit the triple, or it's a 12 horse field. And the favorite is, 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 is three to one or the favorite's eight to five. And it's not all that strong. This is a great triple or super factor race. Never hear that. You'll hear about that pick three, pick four, pick five. And I don't even know why they want to steer you there because they get more churn out of the other bets. So that's a mystery I've yet to unravel, but they, they, they love to steer people to those bets and there are other bets out there. Now, hedging, like I said, I don't do, okay? If I'm alive in the last, and this people will argue mathematically that I'm nuts. I've been called worse than nuts. So I, that doesn't phase me when anybody thinks I'm the stage now where nothing for me to prove to anybody. Okay. What anybody else thinks really doesn't affect me. So if I'm alive in the last leg of a pick four or a pick five or a pick six, and let's say it's a big, big ticket. I'm alive with a couple of different horses for big money. A lot of people will hedge. I look at it like this. I'm, I'm not going to risk my bankroll. I'm not going to risk money. I'm not going to take away from my win by investing money on horses that I, I didn't believe in enough to use. I want to be right. So a lot of times what I'll do is, okay, I take a completely different approach. All right. I go for the kill, not for the hedge. Let's say I'm alive with the three, five, seven, and nine, and every one of them is bringing back over 20,000 for me. Okay. So I got four horses over 20,000. Okay. I'll take one of those horses and punch him in the exacta on top of the other horses. So that now not only am I alive for four scores, but for one of them, I'm alive for a grand slam. Okay, and if it happens, great. If it doesn't, I'm still making my score. So yeah, I'm cutting into that that hit a little bit, but I'm also putting myself in a position to hit a grand slam, which is what we're trying to do. I'm not looking to hedge and say, well, I'm in a position to win a lot of money on these horses. So now I can cover all these horses and bet 100 on all these other horses or 200 on this one or 200 on that one. And I can come out winning a couple of dollars no matter what happens. Okay, you may turn out right that day. You may leave one out that beats you and then wind up uh, losing anyway. Um, I don't do that. I go for the kill and I play to win and I play to make it count when I'm right. People will argue, hey, if you're in a position to guarantee a return, you take it. And they may be right to some extent. It's just goes to that overall discipline and philosophy of playing one way for the score, for the kill. And that's that's what I do. And that's how I believe you can beat the game, okay? Um, place betting, show betting. I can't remember. I've been betting horses since I'm 10 years old, literally. I can't remember the last horse I bet the place. I, don't, I honestly couldn't tell you. I. Well, it's, it's the worst bet you can make, honestly. It, well, it, it, you because you agree with me, but some people will tell you no. Some people will be like, well, hey, if I bet 50 win in place and the horse comes second, I get some of my money back. No, you cost yourself money on the times that the horse won. But that some people just can't get that the same way they will never get what I said is the most important takeaway. Cash less tickets, win more money when you are right. That that is that's the best takeaway that I can yeah. express to everybody. So I don't bet place. I love the pick fours, the pick fives and the pick sixes. 
and I structure those tickets certain ways also, okay? I believe in singles. Singles, you know, even when I was betting a lot of money and playing, playing, playing for a living, okay? I had to somehow control my bankroll and how much I was willing to invest. So a single gives you a, an enormous amount of room in other legs, especially if you're playing with a decent enough, enough size bankroll. So not only do I look for a single, but I also look for what I'll call a short race. So I want one single and I want one race where I'm only two or three deep. Because what does that do? Whether it's a pick four or a pick five or a pick six, that enables me to spread in those other races enough to use enough horses that I'm comfortable I'm going to get by those races. And if I'm right in my other races, it affords me the opportunity that instead of having to pick four or to pick five or to pick six, if it's not a, you know, not a, a, a mandatory on one of those other days, a couple of times, okay? Now, normally I don't better pick six more than once unless it's a rare occasion. But pick fours and pick fives, when I have them, I don't want to have them for 50 cents. I want to have them for a dollar. I want to have them for $2. I want to have them for $5. I want to have them for $10. Having that single and that race with only two or three horses, but better even two, gives you the room to do that and go deep enough on those other, 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 other legs that you're somewhat comfortable. And sometimes, all right, if you're playing with a smaller bankroll, the pick five always offers greater value. It's got a smaller takeout and, and they, they play more than a parlay. But sometimes, okay, if your bankroll is a little restricted, it could be wiser. You've got to think about, am I more likely to cash a pick four ticket for $2 than a pick five ticket for 50 cents if I structure it with this single and this short race in the four race sequence as opposed to the five race sequence where I can only bet it for 50 cents. And that's something that you mathematically have to weigh out depending on your budget and how much you want to invest but or how much you can afford to invest. But it's something that you've, you, you, you've, you've almost got to look at because uh, sometimes, um, especially if the first leg has a very heavy favorite that you're not in love with, uh, you may be better off with the pick four and then not, not, not having to worry about that. Like there's a, there's a bunch of different scenarios that will lead me to the pick four as opposed to the pick five. Um, for you know a better chance of hitting and hitting it multiple times so that's pretty much in a nutshell the short way of of being a better better um and that's what this is about how to be a better better manage your money and structure your tickets and don't create i don't know how to say this right don't create there's obstacles in the way Okay, you're on an obstacle course with horse racing. Okay, takeout is an obstacle. Sharks in the water is an obstacle. Bad trips are, are an obstacle. Bad tickets, that's an obstacle you can control. Um, you know, using bad horses or bad favorites that you don't like, structuring a ticket, including horses that you don't like because you don't want them to beat you or because you used it last time. Remember, you didn't marry him last time, you used them last time. So, it doesn't mean you have to use them this time. There are so many times we do these seminars and webinars or we talk and they're like, oh, John, you got to have this horse. You loved them last time. No, I loved them last time. Today's this time. I didn't like them this time. Uh, you, you know, you have to separate yourself from that. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, Channel Cat killed me the other day from a very big bet. And that's a horse that I made a score on in Saratoga at a big price a couple of years ago. And I think I used him the last three or four times he ran, okay? Of course, the day he was the only speed, I decided, you know what? I've had it with this channel cat. I'm not using him. They're going to catch him even if he is the only speed. And guess what? They didn't. Um, so, you, you know, you we're all, I'm not special. We're all going to be wrong more than we're right. But when you 
play the way that I do and you've done it as long as I have and you realize that you're going to take down your big hits. I didn't cry tonight. Town Cat cost me a lot of money because I know, all right, well, this time it went that way. Next time it's going to go my way. Um, do jockeys, trainers, et cetera, influence who you bet on? Yes, absolutely. I put a lot of weight on trainers um, and a lot of weight on riders. Okay, a lot of people think the rider doesn't matter. I've never been to school of that thought. Um, I know Alan Jerkins, one of the greatest of all time, would say things like you could strap a dog on the back of the right horse and they could win. I just don't, don't look at it that way. I think riders are very important and I think trainers are absolutely very important and they're both a very, very big part of my handicapping and, 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 and how I analyze a race. So with, with, with that, I think I, I got across the outline of, of, of my philosophy and how I structure and how I, I make my wages and some of my do's and don'ts. So now um, I'll open it up to questions and we can use the Preakness card as an example. So if you have an opinion on any of the races in, uh, on, on the Preakness card, I haven't really handicapped it with a fine tooth comb, but I'm familiar enough where I could say, okay, like let's say for argument's sake, you tell me I'm dead set against Medina spirit or I'm all in on Medina spirit. How would you play this? So how would you play that? Um, or what would you do? And you could ask me that or anybody's got any of those questions on any of the races or any of the sequence, fire away. Or any questions for me about my, my betting, my habits, what I do, what I don't do, um, fire away. I'm here. And if there's no questions, that's even better because we'll be done all, all that much sooner. I have a question. I'm ready. Okay. How early do you put your tickets in on the big day? You know, before post time. Um, I, I race time. I, I, as habit, tend to bet late. Okay, I'm one of the few people in the world who never complained about Gulfstream's lag post time that everybody hates because I'm a notorious procrastinator and I like to bet the last minute. And I've actually managed to get myself shut out at Gulfstream, which is almost impossible to do. Um, so I, I like to bet late. I, I feel like knowing as much as you can possibly know is an advantage, okay? And sometimes things happen late. Like I'll give you a, a, an example. Sometimes if a horse breaks through the gate or runs off, um, I don't ever, usually I don't have to cancel my ticket and bet another ticket leaving that horse out because I usually didn't bet yet by the time that happens. I'm usually hitting the, the end send bet button right as the last horse is going in the gate. So, you know, um, that rarely happens to me because I like to bet as late as possible. Does the pool you attempt to hit hard depend on the odds of your strong opinion? How do you prioritize vertical versus horizontal wages as your strong opinion? That's an interesting question. Okay, um, and hold on, Tony, I'll get to you in a second. Um, yeah, I, 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 first off, okay, one of the things I, forgive me, I, I should have covered that I didn't is, I don't bet a lot of tracks on the course of the day. Like Saturday, I'll probably bet Pimlico because it's Preakness Day um, and there'll be big pools and I, I like that. But normally I'll bet one, most two tracks over a day. Um, you know, Saratoga and Del Mar is a little different because I'll do Saratoga in the day, a little Del Mar at night, but usually I'm focused on one track and one meet, and that's kind of where I get in my groove. As far as the pools, I like to go after the biggest pool. And vertical or horizontal, the, the, you know, how I differentiate that is where I think I've got the best value. Like, let's say I like a horse. My best shot on the card is a four to one shot and he's in the pick five. Um, and I think the races that surround that pick five or the other races in that sequence are just too deep, too tough and too, just too easy to get beat in. But I like a four to one shot. Then I'll go the other route. I'll go win in exacta, maybe triple and, and, and super. But if I love the races that surround my key bet or my single, 
then I'll go multi-race wager. And a lot of times I'll double up. I'll take my single in, 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 in both horizontal and verticals. So, but yes, I try. I'm normally looking at a big pool anyway. I don't bet a lot of the smaller tracks because of, of a number of reasons. Um, one of them is the pool size. The other is, and I hate to say this, but I just don't believe that everything is on the up and up at some of the small tracks. I mean, we see things happen in major tracks and major, ma major races that, that, that can impact our wages. So I, you know, I try and have every edge that I possibly can. So I just gravitate towards the bigger pools and the bigger meets. And I also believe that it's easier for me and maybe not for everybody, but for me, I've always found that I've done better with better, 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 class of horses i i love the all stakes pick fours and fives and the all stakes cards because i just i just seem to do better on those days for wh whatever the reason may be how many singles max will you use in constructing say a pick five there's no max to that tony if i have if there's a pick five and i i i mean i remember not too long ago there was a pick five i hit i think i hit it for ten dollars and i had three singles okay um there was one that on tracking trips the other day um, this had to be less than a month ago. Um, and Michael, you can probably remember better than I, when I loved, sh um, shoot or shoot, paid $30. Yep. I, it, 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 I couldn't it, believe it. I uh, hated the horse. Late, right. Shoot or shoot 30 something dollars. Lady nugget or something like that was nine to two. And another horse, I had three singles in the pick five and I, you had the, you had the late pick three at that Santa Anita. Right. I had the late pick three cold single, 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 but I, I, of course, the, the pick five became a daily double for me because I was singling three horses in the last three races. Um, have any advice for getting over bad beats? I'm so competitive that bad beats will stay with me several days. Yes, and that's a big problem, okay? Uh, we all, <laughs> okay? I, I, to this day, okay, there is one bad beat, all right? I'll give you two examples. There's one bad beat that I don't even know what year it is. I'm still not over it, Okay. And I won about 40,000. Okay. So how can you be not over a bad beat? But I can, when it comes to bad beats, I'll give you stories that you won't, won't believe. All right. Midnight Bisu? No, Midnight Bisu cost me a hundred thousand when she, when, when Elate didn't lose her, didn't get by her or got nailed by her at Saratoga a couple of years ago. Okay. That was a hundred thousand dollar nose for me that the announcer, I forget who it was, Dirk and Evans said too close or Colm is too close to call. I'm like, no, it wasn't. She got me. It was not too close to call. And I knew it and cost me a hundred grand, but the one beat I still to this day, never got over um, Michael. And it, it, like I said, I won, I hit the pick six was the Breeders' Cup classic. When oh Spain yeah. Got beat. Okay. Awesome. Who was it? Awesome again that won that race? It was the three horse strong again three. I want to say it was awesome. Yeah, again. awesome again. Okay. Yep. Who I had. Okay. Um, and it's funny how your memory gets bad because for years I described it wrong. I said, you know what? I had to pick six, and I was alive with Swain and the awesome again entry, and it paid like 36 or 38,000 or something. I forgot. I forget exactly what it paid. My memory is going, but I was also alive with Swain, but I had a huge, and I thought for years, a pick four with Swain, but it wasn't. The pick four wasn't out back then. It was actually a pick three. I think I had a $200 pick three or something into, into Swain also, but it was so many years ago, I didn't remember. And then a friend of mine pointed out, he goes, you know, that was before the pick. I'm like, you know, you're right. It was a pick three, but I'm so used to betting pick fours, but it cost me, it had to be, it had to be a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars swing, which I've gotten beat by a nose for money. Like, like I said, if you watch the race with a late with me, okay, that cost me a hundred grand. That photo, you could have been standing next to me at Saratoga that day. You wouldn't have known. All right. I just sat there in bed and I, I do that sometimes. It's just how I am. But that race just because of the way Frankie Dettori rode Swain and kept hitting him with the left hand and he kept bearing out and bearing out and bearing out. And I've never heard a reasonable, plausible explanation for it. I'm, I'm still not over that race. I still sometimes go back and watch it. And I, if I'm mad at myself, that's the best way I could aggravate myself is go watch that race. Um, but to get to your question and the bad beats, 
If there's ever a bad beat contest, I can tell you bad beat stories. The day Zenyatta lost the pick six, okay? I bet $180 pick six, okay? And I singled Zenyatta. And then I went back and I bet the same exact ticket. I said, the only horse can beat her is Blame. I bet the same $180 ticket and singled Blame. So I had two of them. So I actually invested 360 and had Zenyatta in Blame. And I walked back to the window. I was at Calder, okay? They're live watching at Calder. I walked back to the window and I said to the teller, a girl I'm friends with to this day, I said, you know what? Cancel this ticket. Blame is not going to beat her. Zenyatta's going to win the <laughs> Cancel it. And I bet the pick six twice. Remember how I said very rarely? And I had Zenyatta two times in that epic loss to blame. And of course, who beat her? Blame. I canceled the winning pick six. six, six, six. And I had every other horse, including Jerry Hollendorfer's ridiculous horse that won the Breeders' Cup mile. I don't even remember what the horse paid. Um, shoot a shoot the other day led me to the Pick four, so thank you. Yes, can you walk us through your timeline of handicapping, identifying your strong? When you construct your tickets and if you tweak them even more. Yes, okay. Like I said, I'm a procrastinator. Um, and I'll come back to you, Mark L, in a minute. Um, and, and, and you too, Paul. It's hard for me to keep up with everything. Um, I'm a procrastinator, so I, I and, and I spend a lot of time handicapping because I love it and I never want to be unprepared. I don't want to be in a gunfight and I got a knife or I'm in a gunfight and I ain't got no bullets, okay? If I lose, I want you to, you, you, you shot me first, but I don't want to be because I'm not one ready. So I handicap one card and it takes me longer than most people, probably takes me three or four hours, um, sometimes five hours, to really have a good, like I'll handicap the Preakness card four or five hours, okay? And I will make tweaks during the day. While I'm watching the races during the day, I make notes. I write down every race, okay? Who won, where they came from, how their trip was. So any kind of speed bias, closer bias, Mark Lorenzo is probably one of the best guys. If he's still on the show, I might've bought him so much where he got off, but he's one of the best guys at, at, at spotting real track biases and fake track biases and keeping a live running chart of that. And I do that myself um, and how I do it. I don't know exactly how he does it, but how I do it is I, every race, right? You know, who won, where they came from, if they were on the lead, if they stalked, if they came from way off the pace, whether the pace was fast, slow. And I will make adjustments towards my later races, wages, based on those notes and those observations. What's your typical kill shot bet? You said you bought 1,500. How much of that would be in a kill shot bet? Okay, if I bought 1,500, and my kill shot bet would be at least $1,200. At least, okay? And the other 300 would be spread across whatever else I wanted to bet. But I'm a disciplined player, okay? Um, we spoke about discipline. I can sit there and watch 12 races and bet two of them. A lot of gamblers can't do that, okay? And I could have a pocket full of money and do that, okay? Um, not a lot of gamblers can do that. You'll see 80% of the people at the racetrack, when we used to go to the racetrack every day, and they're probably no different at home, I bet this track, that track, oh, they're going in the gate over there, let me bet this track. Oh, where they running over there, let me bet that. Track. Those people got no shot, no shot. They may win today, but long run, no shot. I'm going to devour all of those people. I, I love them because I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to eat them all up over time. Um, one track, maximum two, the races I like, okay? There's no rule that says you're going to the Preakness on Saturday. You got to bet all 12 races. What about the races you don't like? Why are you going to put your money into races you don't like? Patience is another thing. Wait like a cobra, ready to strike when I'm right. The day John cool. can win less, but make it count when you are right is the day I started to become a winning horse player. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, that's Mark. He is here. Um, and, and, and like I said, he's, he's giddy up bets guys got, just got an enormous amount of, of, of talent for this game and, and willingly shares it with, with, with people. And that goes back to what I said earlier is get your information from people that are good because there's, 
so much garbage out there, okay? And just because somebody's loud, obnoxious, and a lot of people may, may uh, you, you know, like somebody liking somebody and taking their betting information are two different people. There's a lot of people I really like, okay? Um, but I don't want to know. I don't really want to know who they're betting on because I, 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 I just don't think they're good betters. So who you listen to is, 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 is a vital. Okay. At the end of the day, it's your opinion, but a second set of eyes, be they mine, be they delos, be they other people out there that are good is always good. You know, four eyes are always better than two. Um, deal was solid, but probably gets his picks from his nephew. That might be true. He might get them from the kid. The kid's probably going to wind up better than all of us because at some point the pupils do usually get better than the teachers. So yes, it's, that's, that's, that's probably true, Stephen. That'll probably happen. I hope I'm still around to see it and, and laugh at him for that. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's probably inevitable. Let me just scroll and see. I know I missed a couple of questions and I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Advice getting over bad beats. We covered that. Um, maximum singles. The pool episode on trainer tells. Yes. Well, we talked about that. Outside of gaining personal experience over time, is there any good source of data, not tips, not stats out there to help supplement your own observations? Um, yeah, Michael, like I said, you know, you, you know, and I'm not here to toot my own horn, but people like myself, people like D'Lo, there are some really sharp players out there that are willing to talk to people. There are some sharp players that are not. Tommy Masters is a good friend of mine, okay? Um, Hammer, made some big scores, very, very sharp player. Uh, but Tommy doesn't give his opinions out because he's still making a living betting horses, and, you know, he'll sometimes give it, give it, give it, give it. Karnawa. Yeah. Um, right, exactly. He gave us on a, we, we had him on a show and he gave out a horse. He said he was, if he's got fifty thousand left in his in his bank that day, he's putting it all on that horse. Who was the horse again, Michael? The horse Tarnow, was, it was Turnaw on the Tarnow, turf uh, Breeders' Cup day. Um, you know, so best you know, turf what I've seen in a long time. You know, Ham is one of them, but Ham is you know. Um, not as likely as, 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 as myself. And I don't know, you, you know, D'Lo loves the game and loves to promote it. Okay. I love the game and love to promote it, but I'll be honest about something that probably won't be very popular. When I was playing for a living. Okay. I was not a well-liked guy at the racetrack. Okay. People used to say, Oh, John, unapproachable, never will tell you who he likes. Never, never get a horse out of him. Okay. Um, the couple of times I would give out a horse, you'd see people literally run to the window um, because they just knew that I was good at the game. And, uh, you, you, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, I had to win. I wasn't in a position where I could afford to share my opinion with anybody. Um, and back then, I'll be honest, I was a little bit more superstitious than I am today. And, you know, another story that I've told, um, the guy's name was Artie, um, was a teller. Um, tall guy with gray hair at Gulfstream and Calder for many years. One day calls me, I used to bet at his window, calls me over and says, Listen, John, I got to tell you something because I, I don't want you to hear it from somebody else. A lot of times when you leave the window, people will come up to me and offer me 10, 20, $30 to give them who you're betting. He goes, and I just want you to know, I never do it. And I'm like, well, I appreciate that. What do you tell them? I tell them, ask you. And like nobody ever comes and asks me because, well, they think you, you, you know, you're un unapproachable. And I was for a long time. OK, I used to sit at the same table with my dad and my dad would get mad at me because he was a social guy. OK, <laughs> and he would like to come to the track and he would want to invite everybody to sit at our table because I had a big table, but it was just me and him. So there was room. And I'd be like, no, I don't want anybody at the table because all day as I'm getting, who do you like? Who do you like? Oh, I don't like anybody this race. Well, if you did, who would you bet? And it just doesn't end. OK, and I didn't want that. I didn't want anybody getting in my head. So I was a little standoffish because I had my game face on. I was making my living now, similar to Mark. I'm in a position where I want to promote the game. I want to see the game grow. I want to see people realize and learn that this is a skill game. And if you attack it right and do the work, D'Lo does his homework. You look at his war room, his setup. I don't I can't, I can't even keep up with his war room and I'm doing this my entire life. All right. He does his homework. He's prepared. Okay. You have to be, to have a shot to beat this game. Um, when I come to play, you could rest assured Saturday. I can't tell you I'm definitely going to win. 
But I can tell you this, it's not going to be because I'm not ready and not prepared and didn't do my homework. There is no shortcut outside of gaining personal experience. What can you do? Okay. You could listen to people who know you could watch shows like this from someone who's lived the life and, and, and been there and done that. And you can do your homework. You can study, you can put in the time and learn. Okay. Yeah. You're not going to gain that experience over years that someone like myself or someone that's been playing a long time has that comes with time. There's no way to get around that. But if you're not prepared, if you ever lose a race and say, you know what, I didn't see that, or I didn't think of that, then you beat yourself. The game didn't beat you. That's on you. That's on you. You can't let that happen. That's your choice when you go into the fight. All right. You want to go in ready and trained, or you want to go in just winging it. If you want to go in just winging it, I say, just take, don't waste your time. Have fun, watch a movie and just bet numbers. Where are we, question-wise? <coughs> Freak this late pick five. Any opinions on French Empire in the ninth and bye-bye mill? I personally don't. I don't know if Michael's done done the... the, the, the so I've handicapped it a bit. Um, I don't... What, what I was thinking about doing, John, was like going through the pick five and saying how I think people will bet it. And then if we want to give opinions, we can. Like I have opinions on the pick five, but it doesn't mean as much as I think going through... Uh, the races and seeing, telling people how the masses will bet and how we can maybe extract money from those races. Exactly. If you have an opinion, I can tell you how I would bet it, but I, I mean, I didn't do the homework yet. So I, I, I really can't. What, what was the race they asked about again? It was uh... two horses in the late pick five, uh, French empire and by another, I will tell you all this. And this is something that you want to, you definitely want to watch. Before the show, I interviewed Chad Brown on the YouTube channel. So you could actually watch the back and forth interview. And we discussed all the horses he has running in the Preakness and some of his training techniques. And let me tell you something, Chad is a sharp mind trainer and as good Great. as a trainer that you will find in this sport anywhere in the world. Okay, world, the guy's worldwide top, top, Five. I mean, he, he, he's that good and he was very, very forthcoming and open. You know, he's got a reputation as being standoffish and whatnot. He was a hundred percent open and, and it, was, it was a great conversation. I was supposed to keep him for 10, 15 minutes. We wound up talking an hour. So I owe him big for that. He, he, he had every right to cut me off, but I, I told him, I'm sorry, I could have spoke to you for five hours, but it's, yeah. it's worth watching. It's up on the website already and it's definitely worth watching. And You'll hear his opinion of all the horses he's got running on Saturday and his opinion on his horses is, is yeah probably as good as mine, maybe even a little better. And, I, and again, I, I've handicapped the pick five and that my opinion's never not going to ever be as good as John's. I, I What I will say about the ninth race, it's, it's going to be a very narrowly bet race in the horizontals. People are either going to single uh, Chub Wagon. Pot, I, I could see some people singling the Chad Brown and I think most people will probably go too. Because in the first leg of a sequence, most people don't want to get knocked down. So they're willing to go a little bigger in the first couple of races. If you look at the pace dynamics, it's a very fast paced race. And I think it's going to hurt Chubb Wagon quite a bit. Um, and I think the two are the eights. And obviously the eights, the Chad Brown, have, have a very good chance of winning this race. If you were going to single a horse, I would probably single uh, uh, Chad's filly, uh, the, the, the French horse. It's I love singles where people don't, okay? I love when my single's in the first leg and get it over with. No, and people don't like singles in the first leg. It's a huge love equity it. builder. I love a single in the first leg. I love to get my single home in the first leg, get it over with, get out of the way, and know now, now I'm off to the races, especially if it's not the favorite. Now, one of the things, yes, one of the things that lead me to a kill shot or to a, 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 a multi-race wager, if I like my single in the first leg and it's not the favorite, I'm almost always all in because I know if I'm right, bang, I already got an edge because I knocked out all the favorite singles and I already created a little bit of separation and I got my spread races coming forward where you know I'm going to have some prices. That to me is one of my favorite scenarios. When that scenario happens, you know I'm going in, okay? 
Um, that that's that's definitely the end of the pool that I want to uh, want to jump in. And another place I love singles is I love singles in the last leg, especially if it's a price. Because yeah. I I love to look at a sequence and say, you know what, I just want to get there. If I can get there and put myself in position, um, and I've spoke about this a lot. Um, and, and Michael knows the story. Last year in the Kentucky Derby at Authentic One. On, on less than $1,000 in bets, okay, right around $1,000 in bets between the pick five and the pick six, I was alive to honor AP for half a million dollars and Sol Volante for a million dollars, okay? There's not many days and there's not many people that can bet $1,000 into a horse race sequence and be alive with a horse for a million dollars. Okay, Sol Volante didn't run a step. I didn't close the deal. I get it. Okay. Honor AP ran second and had the kind of trip where there are still people today telling me, you know, he might have been able to win. I personally don't see it. I think he would have been closer, but I don't think he was beaten authentic. But I don't know the answer to that. But I put myself off a thousand dollars in wages between the pick five and the pick six. Okay. And now I had that Chad Brown single and did my chat. My single was digital age at eight to one. That was the single. That was my key bet. So I was not afraid to single an eight to one shot in the pick five and the pick six, and then only use two horses in the Derby um, honor AP and Sol Volante. There's not a lot of players out there that can put themselves in that position. Did I cry that night? No. Did I feel bad? Yes. But you want to know what I said, you know what? I didn't close a deal this time but I've closed those deals before and I'm going to close them again. So just, I was happy just to put myself in the position because you know what, once you've done this long enough, and this is a good way to get over the bad beats that we touched, this touched on earlier. Okay. And this is, that was, that could be considered a bad beat to be alive for half a million or a million on a thousand dollar bet or whatever the case may be and not close the deal. All right. Even though it wasn't a photo and out of the gate, I kind of knew I was in trouble. But it can be considered a bad beat if you don't close that deal. You know, you do all that heavy yeah. lift, lifting and then you don't hit it home. Okay. How do I get over it? I say, okay, I put myself in position. It didn't happen, but I've done it before and I'm going to do it again. So that's the best way to get over a bad beat. To get over a bad beat and say, you know what? I was right there. Didn't work out this time, but I did it. I got myself there. And if I keep getting myself there and I've already shown that I can get myself there, I'm going to do it. And that is probably the best way to get over a bad beat. Yeah. Turn the page, man. Turn the page. And I'll, and I'll tell you what, PJ, because uh, you asked about Bye Bye Melvin in the 12th. If you like Bye Bye Melvin, that will separate you from everybody in that sequence so well because that race is going to be somewhat narrow. And I think most of the masses will use the two Chad Browns in that race. Some might single the, the best Chad Brown, but I don't think there are going to be very few tick because the, the two race 10 and 11 are huge spread races, right? They're wide open sprints. So the people are going to have very wide tickets in the middle of the sequence. So if you have a big opinion on, on the 12th to beat both Chad Browns, that, that is a, an amazing way to get good equity. So the key is, can you get, can you narrow yourself down in the spread races and then, and then absolutely kill them in the 12th. Because that's a great opinion to have. And I, I certainly think Bye Bye Melvin's got a chance to win a super honest horse. Um, you know, to, 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 to add to what Michael is saying is that's another scenario I love. When, when he said those two races, and like I said, I haven't done them yet, so I'm at a, at a disadvantage when it comes to that. But if I like a horse like Bye Bye Melvin, and I'm- a, it's, a, it's a digital age type horse, John. It's exactly I don't the same. Who, I, I, mean, I don't know anything about the race yet, but I will say this. Like digital age, I singled at eight, 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 eight. And bye bye is 10 to one right now. I like a horse yeah. in a race that's got 12 horses, okay, that everybody's looking at as a spread race. And my single can be in that race. I love that sequence. To me, very few are going to single this race. Very few. That's an edge to me, okay? An edge to me is having my single in a race that a lot of people ain't going to single. Okay, that's a huge edge for me, and I create separation because if I'm right, now, now 
I got them over a barrel, okay? Because everybody, you got to realize you're playing against the other people in the pool. So if there's a race with 12 horses and they got to use eight of them or 10 of them or six of them or 12 of them to get to the winner and I have to use only one, how many more times if I'm right, am I going to have that ticket than them? That's how you beat those computer players too. OK, because they'll use every different algorithm that they can come up with in that 12 horse field because they don't want to get knocked out of that pick five because they're investing a ton of money. If I could get there with one horse or two horses, cha-ching, I'm going after them. OK, to me, that's an edge. So that's another thing that I look for. A very good example. So I don't know if Bye Bye Melbourne's the horse for me, because like I said, I sure. haven't yet, but that principle absolutely is something that I'm all in on 100 percent. Yeah. And to be honest, Bye Bye Melvin, I'm probably going to use, but it's not the race I'm going to go narrow in. Because again, if we look at the sequence, guys, nine is going to be a super, race nine is, again, this is the late pick five with all the stakes. Race nine is going to be a very short race for most people. People are either going to love Chub Wagon or they're going to love this Chad Brown. Okay. I, and again, I'm not, not to give you super handicapping, but it's a very fast paced race. I think the Chad Brown's coming off the pace has a huge advantage. Uh, that race nine, I'm going to pick two mm -hmm. more. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I like the I like two closers in that race. I like the two and the eight because they're coming off the pace. But I think the eights easily could be a single. 10 11, we talked about one's a turf sprint, one's a dirt sprint. Everybody's yeah. gonna spread in these races. If you don't if you don't like a long shot in either 12 or 13, you know, 12 or the preakness, I would try to go narrow in 10 or 11. Because though that's where you're gonna like what John was saying, it's 10, 11, almost nobody's gonna single either of those races. It's really hard. But if you can well, get past now I'll, now I'll be determined to. But um Delo's got a message for everybody on there. If you're not reading the comments, he says do not. And if he says do not, it's good to pay attention. He's one of those do the few. I told you very few pay attention. We already said he's one of them. Do not leave off. Number two, keep me in mind in the Preakness. That's the Robertino Diodoro's horse that David Cohn is riding, I believe. Um, so that's that's Dilo's opinion. I can't agree or disagree because, like I said, I haven't I haven't done the race yet. Well, and here's the thing: that's another interesting opinion because everybody's in the in the Preakness. Everybody's just going to throw the two backwards on that pick five, and that's probably going to be it for ninety percent of the pool. So if you can if you can be either backward. And keep keep me in mind, probably going to be the next or the second choice after the Bafferts. It's a great pick. It's an amazing pick because again, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I like keeping me in mind, but it is such a great separator in a, in a very tough sequence because because nobody's going to pick against the Bafferts. That's what you got to look for. You got to look for those you know opportunities to separate yourself from the pack because you you know you're playing against. Uh, you know the other other people in the pool, so those are the kind of angles to look for but you know the takeaways are i think you know good information listen to people who know what they're talking about and are sincere and have you know been there done that you know um be willing to cash less but win more okay um that's what it's all about capitalizing when you're right fundamentals okay fundamentals all right driving the race car properly we're both in the same car. You put us both in the same Ferrari, okay? And I know how to drive it right. And you were not taught how to drive it right. I'm going to beat you nine out of 10 times that we race, okay? Floyd Mayweather is going to beat the one punch fighter 99 out of 100 times. Skill, fundamentals, preparation will get you there, okay? Um, there's no shortcuts. We're talking about money. You're talking about making money. No short. The only only one way that there's only one shortcut way to make money that I know, and it'll wind up getting you in trouble. And somebody told it to me at the racetrack a long time ago, and we'll end on this this note. Some of you may find it funny, some of you may not. But at the racetrack, um, guy says to me, "How you doing?" I said, "Ah, I'm doing terrible." There was a teller behind the window. It was not my dad. I said, ah, "I'm doing terrible. I'm broke. I'm disgusted. I can't catch a winner. I don't know. I don't know which way to turn. I've never been in such a such such a slump." He goes, "Ah, he goes, I'll help you. Don't worry about it." I says, "Are you going to help me?" He goes, "I'll help you." He goes, "Are you busy tonight?" I said, "No." He says, "Okay, go home. Never mind the racetrack. Go home, and I want you to stand in front of the mirror 
and practice something for a couple hours, then meet me nine o'clock tonight and I'll go take you. I'll get you out of all your money trouble. I'm like, all right, sounded great. I didn't know the guy was kidding. So what, what, what do you want me to do? He said, Just go home, stand in front of the mirror and practice saying, stick them up. He says, what? He goes, practice saying, stick them up. That's the only shortcut that I know to making money. Stick them up, okay? And we don't want to do that because we know where you wind up. So do the homework. You got to do the homework. Um, you got to put in the time, you know, no shortcut. You see D'Lo wins. Okay. But look at what he's doing. All right. He's taking care of, care, care, care of his nephew. Yeah. But he's got the war room going, you know, Preakness. I'm doing four or five hours worth of homework before I start taking my money out of my pocket or punching things on my cell phone. All right. A lot of people don't do that. If you do, you already got an edge on 60, 70, maybe 80, 80% 80 of the people. I'm of the opinion, and most people say that I'm wrong, that about 5% of the people that play this game actually win. And I include the grinders who grind out a little profit and the ones that actually make money, all right? And to me, that's the benchmark if you make money. You know, like I said, churning 100,000 and coming out with 102,000, that's great. You want 100,000, a lot of work for me for two, to come out ahead 2,000, okay? Um, like I said, if I turn a hundred thousand, I want to win 50, 75, a hundred thousand, 200, but that's my philosophy, but you have to, you have to do the work, you know, you have to do the work. It's a skill game. This game, it really is. There are intangibles in it. Okay. Um, but the value and the money management and the knowing how to bet and the structure and the, all of that stuff. You can balance those intangibles. You can balance those bad trips. You can balance all the luck and everything else that goes into this game, even the cheating aspect that goes into this game. You can balance it all out if you apply those, those fundamentals right. And uh, with that, I thank you all for your time. Um, I thank you all for your support. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would love to get a little shout out or a little love out on social media, that always helps. Um, and if I could ever answer any questions, all right, I'm always accessible. Um, you can email me through the website. Um, you can contact me on social media. I never leave anybody hanging that's got a sincere question. Um, go out of my way to help anybody out there with anything that, 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 that I can. Um, you know, my opinions don't apply for everybody. If there's something that works for you, I encourage you to do it. Like I said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But uh, if you want another set of eyes or another opinion, Delo's the same way. I'm sure you could reach out for him. You could reach out to Michael. You could reach out. You know, there were good people. Hammer will even answer you if you if you reach out to Hammer and ask him. He'll even answer you. So there's there's a lot of good people out there that you could reach re reach out to that that you you, you know walk the walk and talk the talk and, 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 and are willing to share. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that are very good at this game that nobody ever heard of and nobody knows who they are on social media as well. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of sharks in the water. Um, so how do we beat them? We come ready. So come ready. And thank you, everybody. Um, total pleasure. Um, I think we're going to put this up on a website as well, probably tomorrow. Um, so you can come back and refer to it. And, uh, Arrivederci. Thank you. Have a nice day. Gino Rosso has taken the lead. And it's a vintage performance by Vino Rosso. Nobody does it better.